to get there through the midday. Go ahead and stand up with us. Thank you. 
God who takes away the sins of the world. And God, I pray that today that you would just be at work in our hearts today, God. Spirit of God, I pray that you would just be at, on the move in the hearts and in the minds of all of those in this, this room here today. And God, I pray that we would realize that there's nothing more, nothing more powerful known to mankind than your blood, Jesus. And so, Jesus, we thank you that you are alive today, that you conquered the grave, that you are alive. And so, God, we can walk in victory. God, we can live in freedom because of you. And so, God, I pray that you would anoint Daniel as he brings your word this morning. And God, I pray that he would preach with boldness every word he ought to preach. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I failed to show him how to turn on the mic. That was my fault. You did great up there. Hey, I'm so thankful to get the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, Dr. White, thank you for having us this week. It means a lot that, that we can be here. I, I want to start differently today, okay? I'm going to need help because I heard that there is a, a class around here called Advanced PE. Is that a real thing? Um, all the guys in Advanced PE, I need to see you. Will you raise your hand? I need guys in Advanced PE. I need you. Will you come up to the stage? I need you 100% and you. Yes, up to the stage. Okay, we're going to try something to start with. This is what I want you to do. Very, very simple. Josh, we're going to break this. Can we move this? Where's Josh? Um, this is what I want you to do. By the way, I think advanced PE is a great class. I wish I could have taken that in high school. I don't know why I didn't get that option. Okay, here's your line. Stand behind this. This is your line. This is what I want. Oh, what's your names? I know they know you, but I don't. I'm Aiden. Aiden. Let's hear it for Aiden. I'm Gavin. Aiden, got it. Went That's my fault. You know, you know. Okay, come stand over here. Come stand over here. Here's what we're going to do. This is your line. This is, I'm not talking to anyone. This is your line right here. Okay? I want you to see, you can run. I did this line because that one's too close to the side. I want you to jump by here. I want you to see how far you can jump across the platform. From there to however far you can make it. Just make sure you jump by here. Okay? You've got to jump by here. We want to see how far you can make it. Okay, this is advanced PE. It's very, very simple. <laughs> This is, this is the line. I want to see how, hard, how far you can jump starting from here. If you want to run, if you want to flat foot, I don't care whatever you do. Just jump by this line, and we're going to see who can make it the furthest. Okay? Simple? Simple enough? I promise this goes with what we're doing today. It's going to look crazy to start with, but there's a, there's a purpose behind the madness. Okay? Whenever you're ready, you'll be first for us. Okay? Come on. Let's hear it for us. Go. second line right here the line to beat second line okay that was like basically a tie this is the, I can tell y'all been doing the same workouts in advance PE that's obvious okay let's see I'm gonna, just for sheer effort I'm gonna give you the win on that come on let's give it up for them way to go guys that was awesome way to be advanced in PE I love it I love it, I love it, I love it. Okay, this is why we did that this morning. Do you know the longest long jump that has ever, um, ever existed? Did I say that right? The, the furthest that a man has ever jumped in the history of the Olympics or any track um, athletic event, um, the furthest that, that anyone has ever jumped is 29 feet. 29 feet from this spot. To give you an idea, if you take this spot and you go through the wall with it, you'll hit 29 feet. Seven, seven feet each of these, so we got 14. You can do the math. We're going through the wall with 29 feet. Watch this, students. Most of us are trying to live the Christian life, jumping over and over, trying to hit a mark that's impossible to hit. I want to talk to you today about what it is to walk with Jesus and what it is to overcome sin. See, Galatians chapter 5 says this. 
that if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I think if we're honest this morning, most of us have tried this before. You say, I've tried to walk with Jesus before. It just doesn't work like it works for other people. We've all heard the testimonies in church of the drug addict or um, uh, the alcoholic who gets saved and they never want to take a drink again. Like, what an incredible testimony. But you're like, look, that's not me. I tried this thing. I prayed a prayer once. I surrendered my life at an altar. I filled out a card. I was baptized. I tried to read the word. It did not work for me. I want to lay before you today what I believe it is to walk with Jesus. And based on Galatians, if you walk with Jesus, you will overcome sin. See, there are all kinds of sin represented in this place. I went to public school first, and then during high school, I moved to private school. Some of y'all have made that transition. And this is what I found out moving from public to private school. Everything that existed in the public school existed in the private school. Only at private school, it was private. We drank the same things they drank. We partied the same way they partied. We smoked the same things they smoked. We acted the same way with our girlfriends and boyfriends that they acted. Only most of our parents and teachers believed we were good because they sent us to a Christian school. But everything that existed at the first school I went to existed at the second. It was just we were a lot more private. See, we know the pain of failure. We have tried this leap before. And at our very best, I'm saying on the days we nailed it, we hit like seven feet, maybe on a great day, 14 feet. We're never hitting 29 feet. So how do we do it? How do we walk with the Lord in such a way that we overcome sin? I, here's the thing. The psalmist said, my iniquities, literal word there, my bit toward sin, my bit toward rebellion, my iniquities have overtaken me. And all of us this morning could probably name a sin or a few sins that we're bent toward. Maybe the world presses you and you respond in anger. Maybe the world presses you and you respond in depression. Maybe the world presses you and you just uh, respond in lust. I don't know what your sin is this morning, but you do. I don't know what you're wrestling with this morning, but you do. And this is what I believe. I have come this morning to tell you that who you are is not who you have to be. That what you struggle with can be overcome in Jesus. That just because you have prayed a prayer or sat in an altar or cried out to the Lord before and a few months later you fell into the same things just because you've already been through that. Let me tell you, there is victory today in Jesus. And I believe that I'm here for somebody, maybe for multiple people who look like they have it all together on the outside, but who are dying on the inside. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 1. The Lord really brought me to a place where this passage is what changed uh, the way that I viewed Christianity. You're going to hear a little bit of my story later, but these are the seats I used to sit in. Not literally here, but I'm telling you, I went to Denby Baptist. Some of y'all play Denby in different sports. Um, I went to Denby over in Newport News, and I'm telling you, um, I, I went to the chapels, heard all the stuff, and I was dying on the inside, but you would never know it if you looked at me. I had it all together, all together. At the time, I had the beaver cut. Did you get a, like a crick in your neck while you throw it? You know what I'm talking about? That was big when I was in school, okay? Way to go, 2011, baby. You know, that was a good single that it came out with. Okay, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I want you to look at this and, uh, and read it with me this morning. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
for us to understand this passage this morning, we got to understand what comes before it. Now, you go to a Christian school, and so I'm guessing at some point, at some time, you have studied Hebrews chapter 11 in your Bible classes. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of fame of Christianity. These were the best dudes who have ever done this thing. They rock. They're incredible. I want you to think about some of them with me. You have a man like Noah who built the most insane ship of all time, like engineering feet, and he did it with his own hands. And then God destroyed all of the earth except him and his family. Okay, pretty legit dude. Then you got a man named Abraham who left his home searching for a city. This is what scripture says, whose builder and maker was God. He didn't know where he was going. He just left it all to follow the Lord. You have a man like Jacob. Jacob uh, is such an interesting character in Scripture. You know, we, we um, worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Old Testament tells us. Jacob had this um, incredible wife that was just smoking hot, according to Scripture. I'm not making that up. That's in Scripture. Named Rachel, and he just loved her. Then he has this other wife named Leah, which wasn't really part of the plan, but he got her. And it was like the ultimate sister wives reality show. Like Jacob's life is nuts. But incredible man of God filled with faith, we hear of him. You have Moses who walks up to the Red Sea and is like, dry land, walk across. These are like the most unbelievable people. You've got Joshua who defeated the superpower of his day, the strongest fortress of his day with a prayer walk. Like didn't say nothing, just walking around the wall praying. At the end of it, he blows a trumpet and the walls fall. I mean, how insane. you got David who's a man after God's own heart. And when I read Hebrews chapter 11 and I think about the people in Hebrews chapter 11, I think... The writer of Hebrews could not possibly know me. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Like the first half is supposed to encourage me. I am nothing like these men. He doesn't know how many times I've failed. He doesn't know how frustrated I get with my walk with the Lord. He doesn't know about my sin. The writer of Hebrews cannot know how weak I am. He obviously does not know Daniel Etheridge or he would not have written this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, how is that supposed to be an encouragement? But then I think about the men that Hebrews chapter 11 mentions again. Well, sure, Noah was the man who built the ark and yet... After they get on dry land, he has this moment where he falls into sin and he becomes drunk one night. And you have a man like Jacob whose life is habitually, um, he's a, a habitual liar. He lies over and over again. Abraham does the exact same thing. You have a guy like Moses who's a murderer or a guy like David who commits adultery. And yet somehow, some way, their lives were not defined by failure, but by faith. There's something in this passage that um, will show us how our lives will not be defined by our sin, but rather by our God. What is it that these men have that I don't have? What is it that they realize that I don't realize yet? Well, I want us to look exactly what Scripture says about them. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also, just like them, also, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. Students, if I had a title for my message this morning, if I had one phrase I wanted you to walk home with, if I had one thing that I wanted you to know, the one key to living the Christian life is look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. I want to outline for you three things that they do looking to Jesus. The first one, it says, let us lay aside every weight. I need you to help me this morning. Say, throw off the weight. Oh no, I'm going to put this mic down and we're going to end right here. 
You got to say it like you mean it. You got to say it like you're going to understand this and live it. Say, throw off the weight. Throw off the weight. The first thing it mentions is that they throw off the weight. Now, weight is a, a morally neutral thing in this passage. And this is what I mean by that. It's not inherently good. It's not inherently bad. You say, how do you know that? Because he separates sin and weight. He's about to talk about sin. That's not what he mentions first. He mentions weight. Throw off the weight. Students, if you're going to live the life that God intended you to live, if you're going to fix your eyes on Jesus, you've got to throw off the weight. I told you weight is not a, it's a morally neutral thing. It's not necessarily bad. But anything in our life, even good things that we place above God becomes idols. And we have all kinds of things that steal our affection and our focus off of Jesus. It might be a relationship. It might be a sport. It might be a hobby or an interest. I don't know what it is for you, but we have all kinds of things that compete with our relationship with Jesus. And if we're going to be the people that God has called us to be, we must learn to throw off the weight. What is it, students, in your life that distracts you from the things of God? What is it in your life that you seek more than you seek Jesus? What is it in your life, a good thing that you have taken and you have made into an idol just because of your obsession over it? Students, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to throw off the weight that's in our lives. Say, throw off the weight. He starts by saying, let us lay aside these weights. But he doesn't just say, throw off the weight. He says, and the sin which clings so closely. And the sin which clings so closely. If the first thing we do is throw off the weight, the second thing we need to do is throw off sin. Say, throw off sin. Throw off sin. Say, throw off sin. Throw off sin. We've got to throw off the weight in our lives. But we've got to throw off sin in our lives. If you are anything like me at this point, this is where I shrink down or I'll just turn off my brain on this sermon. I have heard a million sermons. A lot of people preach on getting rid of sin. Anybody ever heard a sermon on, on getting rid of sin in your life? And yet, uh, here's a little bit of my story. I was, I was saved at the age of 11. I was sitting, uh, it was a Sunday night, I was sitting on the second row, two seats in, right where you're sitting. And I heard the gospel that night, students, like I had never heard it before. My dad is a preacher. I've heard it a lot of times, but I'm telling you, it was like, it was brand new. And for the first time in my life, I realized that I was a sinner. For the first time in my life, I realized that I needed a savior. And for the first time in my life, I realized that his name was Jesus. And I responded to him that night. And this is what I noticed very quickly. When I got home, my desire for sin was still there. And immediately I thought, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. I've heard the testimonies. I know people who follow Jesus and God just took that sin away from them. He took that desire away from them. So obviously Jesus doesn't work for me. Listen to me. And the greatest addictions and sins that I have ever walked through happened post-salvation. That's going to sound like a weird phrase. You say, well, Daniel, how do you know that you were saved? I had never been convicted about sin. I had never had a desire to follow the Lord. And yet in this period of time, I had the, this burning passion in my heart. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I knew that the Lord had placed that there. But I also had this voice in my head. You've already tried. Like you went to an altar and surrendered to the Lord. And all this sin and all this desire still remains. You already tried. Jesus doesn't work for you. And I walked into the greatest addictions that I've ever walked into. Let me tell you, students. Um, I believe that there is hope in Jesus. And I do not care what you're facing. Statistically in this room, this will just make you want to scream. If I just draw a line down the middle of this room, right down the middle, 
we can take 50%, that's the most conservative, the absolute most conservative statistic we have. 50% of this room is struggling with pornography. You say, how do I know that? Well, between the ages of 11 and 18, Christianity Today reports from their findings that 50%. Barna Research, if you know them, Barna Research, these are not unbelievers who claim to be unbelievers. These are people who claim to be saved. Barna Research says 67%. You say, well, is that girls or is that guys? It's both. Barna said that 30% of the people on their survey that said they were struggling were female. We've treated this like a guy's issue. You say, Daniel, you can't talk about that. We're in a Christian school. We don't talk about that. We hide that. There are huge sins in this room. There are girls struggling with eating disorders. There are guys struggling with eating disorders. Statistically, there are a lot of people in this room struggling with same-sex attraction. A lot of people in this room struggling with depression. There are a lot of things represented in here. And students, I do not believe because you sit in a Christian school or because your parents are believers or because your teachers teach you the gospel that these sins have not touched you. We know these sins. For many of you, you know the guilt and shame of this sin as you set up in the back seat of a car. Or you know it as you put out something that you were smoking. Or you know it as, as you left a party that you shouldn't have been at. Or you knew it as you cleared the history on your smartphone. You know these sins. I know these sins. They're not far away from me. They're not a statistic. They're intimately familiar to my life. Side note. Adults and teachers in the room, coaches, I would love to say that you're exempt from this. But statistics say 30 and above, over 40% 40, 40 of Christians claim to be struggling with these things at the age of 30 and above. Students, these are not going to be sins that have a, a lifelong hold on your life. You've got to throw off the weight. You've got to set aside things that are distracting you from Jesus. But you also have to throw off sin. This is what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says it's better for you to cut off your own arm. Or better for you to gouge out your own eye if it causes you to sin. Than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus is saying whatever it takes. I don't care what it takes. Whatever it takes, get rid of sin in your life. You say, well, I've tried to come clean to some buddies one time. And depending on your aptitude, that coming clean probably lasted a week, a day, a month, or ten minutes. But most of us don't need to cut off our arm. Most of us don't need to gouge out our eye. We need a generation of students who will say, if my iPhone causes me to sin, I will not have an iPhone. If I cannot control myself with my boyfriend or my girlfriend, I do not need one. We need a generation of believers who say, whatever it takes, I'm going to defeat this. I don't care if it makes me look weird. I don't care if other people don't uh, understand it. I don't care if I have to have a flip phone. I'm not going to do this anymore. We've got to throw off the weight and the idols in our lives. But students, we've got to throw off the sin. Say throw off the sin. Throw off the sin. Look at me. What sin... Do you need to throw off in your life? How long will it defeat you? As a child of God, today is the day that can change. He gives us a third thing here. He says, first, you've got to throw off the weight. Second, you've got to throw off the sin. And he ends by saying, let us run with endurance the race marked out for us. The third thing is run with endurance. Say run with endurance. Now listen to me. The first and second thing are completely dependent on the third. If you have every boundary that mankind has ever known, but you do not do the third thing, you cannot overcome sin. 
It has to be more than a roadblock. It has to be a continual pursuit. I love the theme this week is so walk in him. As you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in him. And walking is a present continual action. At any point, at any single point, if I stop, I am no longer walking. And that's how running is. At any point, if I stop, I'm no longer running. And how many messages is it going to take to say you have to read the Bible daily? You have to pray daily. You've got to spend time with Jesus daily for you to understand the reason that we can't overcome sin is because we're reading our Bible maybe one day a week, maybe three days a week, and we're expecting that to give us the power and the strength to overcome. We've got to run with endurance. We've got to set our eyes on Jesus and passionately pursue him. Now, here's where my fear comes, especially in a Christian school. You just heard me say that, and you got your list ready. So I need to read my Bible every day. I need to pray every day. I need to spend this much time with the Lord. I need to go to church every Sunday. And you pull out a list and make a list. Legalism has never saved anyone. Legalism has never saved anyone. Some of you have tried to read the word and you can't overcome sin, but you're like, I'm waking up in the mornings and reading my Bible. Why is that? Listen to me. Why are you reading your Bible? We read our Bible. We spend time in prayer because we believe that that's how we know God. We believe that that's how we come to know Jesus. We do not do it to save ourselves. Listen, if you're getting up in the morning and you're reading your Bible or you're doing all these Christian works to try and save yourself, that is not the gospel. In the name of Jesus, get rid of that. Now listen, I still want you to do the actions. You still need to read your Bible. You still need to pray. But there's got to be an understanding in your walk with the Lord. I do this to know Jesus. I don't do this to save myself. If you, if you try to do this in order to save yourself, depending on your aptitude, which some people will be more than others, depending on how long you can put up with it, you'll do it for a few weeks, a few months, maybe even a few years. And then you'll wake up one day and be so burdened by the weight of having to be your own savior that you'll walk away from it. I have friends who did that who wanted to go into ministry, wanted to follow the Lord and spent time in Scripture. And yet they were never spending time to know Jesus. They were spending time to save themselves. When Jesus said, it is finished, it meant that all the work was complete. And so on days when I spend time with Him and get to know Him, I'm found in Him. And on days when I fail, I run to Him. There is one just very clear way to know where you stand when it comes to this issue. Because I'll, I'll give it to you. This is a hard one to, to differentiate. Why do I spend time in the Word of God? If when you fall, you run away from Him. Now listen, if when you fall, you run away from Him. So you have a bad day, a rough week, and you feel like you can't pray. You feel like you can't read Scripture. You stop doing those things. If when you fall, you run away from Him, those things are legalistic to you. But if when you fall, you run toward him, you understand the gospel and grace of God. When you fall, where do you run? Do you run away from him or do you run toward him? The mark of a mature believer is not do they fall. They do fall. I just read to you the greatest believers who have ever lived fell. The mark of a mature believer is not if we fall, but when we fall, where do we run? The Christian life is not one of perfection. It's one of repentance. And so run to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Don't try to make yourself right. Listen, time and space is not going to make you right before the Lord. Going back to Him will. So who is 
Jesus, if, if all of these, throw off the weight, throw off sin, run with endurance, if all of those have to be understood around the phrase, looking to Jesus, then who is Jesus? Well, he tells us right here that Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, students, I know many of you think you have tried this thing. You think you have um, tested out Christianity and it did not work for you because you're still sitting here with a lot of sin and a lot of idolatry and a lot of struggle. You think that somehow you've tried Christianity, but you have not tried Jesus. Listen to me. Do not give up. Do not walk away. Keep pressing in. Keep looking to him. Keep running to him. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He started this thing and he's going to be faithful to complete it. That's exactly what Philippians tells us. He started this thing and he is going to complete it. He's the God who's able to keep us from falling. Jesus is the one that we look to and run to. Jesus is the one that we serve because he did this right. When you and I could never do this right, he did this right. Let me tell you, it was not a 29-foot jump that he made. It was so much further than that. Jesus walked on this earth. He experienced the temptation that you and I experienced. He dealt with with exactly what it's like to deal with what you're dealing with. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in every way and yet without sin. And for every time that I went wrong, Jesus made the right decision. For every morning that I didn't wake up and read his word, Jesus is perfection. And let me tell you, even though he lived the perfect life at the end of his life, he went and died on a cross. And none of that was because of him. It was because of me. He took all of my sin, all of my shame on himself on the cross, and he died on my behalf. And they laid his body in a cold, borrowed tomb. But three days later, you say, Dana, we've heard the gospel. I don't know that you have. Maybe you have, but maybe you just haven't understood it. Three days later, eyes that had been matted with blood opened again. And a heart that had been totally emptied began to fill with blood and beat again. And skin that had been ripped and torn for all of my sin healed and the pigment came back in it. And Jesus Christ got up from the grave with the presence of mind to fold the cloth that had been surrounding him. And he rolled away the stone and walked out. What sin, what idol is keeping you from that? Jesus Christ has overcome it all. He made the leap that we could never make. And now his offer to us is not try harder, do more. That's not his offer. His offer is not go back to the line and try to jump again. That's not the offer. The offer is I've already made the leap for you. So come get to know me. I'll train you in righteousness. Every day I'll walk with you. And day by day by day, as scripture says, from one degree of glory to another, I'll make you like myself. And one day when I stand before him, I will be like him. And it will not be because I was a good Christian. It will not be because I worked hard or did a lot. It will not be because I was a pastor. It will be because his perfect life counts on my behalf. The one key you've got to get is the only way to live the Christian life is to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. I don't know where you're at, but I do know that right now there are two voices speaking in this room. There is the voice of Satan who scripture calls the accuser. 
and, and Satan speaks shame into our lives. And this is what he'll do. He'll show us an area of our life. Okay, man, that's an area of idolatry and that's an area of addiction and sin. I guarantee you he's already pointed it out to you in this sermon. But the accuser points it out to us while simultaneously convincing us it's impossible to change. This is what it sounds like. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you've done? Do you know how many times you've tried and failed? I know you hear him talking. You can't do that. You've seen other people who, who are able to do this whole Christian thing. That's not you. You can't do that. But there is another voice in this room that is so much greater. And scripture says that, that if Satan is the accuser, that Jesus is our advocate. And very similarly, I guarantee you that the Spirit of God in this message has pointed out to you the idols in your life. For many of you, he has pointed once again to that area of addiction, to that area of sin, to the thing that keeps binding you and holding you. And yet his cry is so different from Satan's. Come to me. Come to, I know you messed up. That's why I died. I didn't die because you were perfect. I died because you weren't. I knew how messed up you were. I knew how much sin you had. In your sin, I died for you. I didn't die for some better version of you. While you were yet a sinner, I died for you. Come to me. Walk with me. Get to know me. I love you. It's not over. I have exactly what you need. We can overcome this together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 10 through 11. It says this, For we know that the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, and swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to this phrase. But such were some of you. And you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care what your issue is. I don't care what it is. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care what facade you've put on. I believe that this is the morning where all that can change. And that's why I came with this message. Uh, Josh is going to go uh, play guitar. We're not going to sing to end this message. It's not how I want to end it. We talked about three specific things. We throw off weight. We throw off sin. We run with endurance. Some of you have idols in your life that you need to deal with. Others of you have sin in your life that you need to deal with. Still others of you just need to pursue the Lord. You need to run with endurance. You need somebody to disciple you. Everything I've talked about is just discipleship 101. And this is your time to respond to that. I'm, I'm old-fashioned in one sense. I really believe that movement, listen to me, solidifies what the Word of God has said to you. That when you get up and you move, or when you respond to what God has told you to do, that it solidifies what the Lord has told you. And so this is what we're going to do. We're not going to sing. I already told you that. Um, I don't know if you ever use this area as an altar, but this morning it's going to be. This is what I want you to do. I'm going to pray over you. And if you are dealing with idols that you need to put to death, or you are dealing with sin, 
or you are dealing um, with the struggle of knowing how to walk with the Lord, how to run daily with endurance. I'm going to ask you to do one of two things. One, I want you to come pray up here. You say, why? I told you I believe movement is part of responding to the Lord. And Scripture says in 1 John, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So I want you to come up and pray. I, nobody, else, Look, you're like, well, people will, will know that I went to pray. They don't know what you went to pray about. So respond to the Lord. And at the end of the day, who cares? Who cares? The second thing that I'm going to tell you is there are leaders and teachers all around this place. And 1 John tells us confess to the Lord, but James chapter 5 says confess one to another that you may be healed. A lot of you have already been to an altar way, probably way too many times. You don't need to go to another altar. You need a mentor, a guide. You need somebody who will speak into your life. You need somebody who will help you set up barriers against the sin that you're falling to. You, you might just need someone to teach you to pray. Maybe your parents don't walk with the Lord. Maybe um, you haven't seen an example of what it is. How do you get up every morning and do this? That's why your leaders are here. Throw off the weight. Throw off the sin. Run with endurance. And all of those have to be done looking to Jesus. I'm going to pray as soon as I say amen. I want you to just respond like the Lord tells you to. Let's pray together. God, the best I know how, I have delivered the message that you have given me. And I pray knowing that the Spirit of God right now is speaking to students, maybe even teachers' hearts. And so God, I pray that we would not just hear your word, but we would act on it. Not just hear your word, but we would live in it. Not just hear your word, but we would do it right now in the name of Jesus before the enemy has time to steal this word from us. I pray we would respond to it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Maybe God's dealing with uh, uh, your heart. Maybe He's speaking to you. Obviously, He's speaking to students. Um, listen to me. How long are you going to struggle? How long? God has something He wants to do in your life. And you just can't continue to sit in the same place and do the same things and expect different results. So my challenge so simply today is this. Um, I'm so thankful for the people who are already praying up here. And I really, really believe um, that there is going to be a breakthroughs for many of you as well. Maybe you just didn't have the courage to come down here, and that's fine. Um, and so today, um, I want you to find one of your teachers, one of your leaders, one of us before the day ends. And I want you to talk to them about what God's doing in your life. I don't care who it is. I want you to find them and, and talk to them about what the Lord is doing in your life. If you don't, this will be yet another service where God could have freed you. God could have changed your life but you were unwilling to act on the word God gave you. So I want you to, to find somebody by the end of the day. Find someone. If you don't have a church home, I'm not, I'm not uh, dumb enough to think that because you come to a Christian school that all of you go to church. Community is necessary to walk with Jesus. It's necessary. And there are phenomenal churches in this area. You need to be in a community walking with Jesus. And so... Maybe find some of your friends in church they go to or uh, visit a, a church in this area and just learn what it is to walk in community and walk with Jesus. I want to end, Dr. White, if it's okay today, I just want to end in a very reflective uh, mood, if that's okay with you. I know you have stuff to go to. You have classes to go to and that kind of thing. And um, I, I'm, uh, I just don't want you to miss what the Lord wants to do in your life. Um, students, if you're praying, keep praying. Pray as long as you need to pray. Students, if you need to talk to somebody, adults, please be available. And um, you just follow what the Lord 
is asking you to do.